Welcome to Electron Line. In this example, we have a roof truss called a gamble roof. And what we're supposed to do here is find out which of the members are under compression, which ones are under tension, and what is the magnitude of the forces on each of the members. The first thing again you want to do is figure out how much force is on the end points, the support points right there. And we can do that by summing up the moments about each of the points. Let's say that we label these as A, B, C, D, and E. So those are the joints on the horizontal here. Uh, it was E, how about F and G, and then up here we'll call this one H. Notice the dimensions. Each of these members are 8 meters long. This one is 10 meters long. These members is, are 6 meters long, and this is twice 6 or 12 meters long. Also, let's see here. Notice that we have some forces acting on the roof from the top. These are all in kilonewtons, as indicated there with the red letters. 3, 6, 6, 6, and 3 kilonewtons. And let's go ahead and get started. We're going to sum up all the moments about point A, the sum of all the moments about point A is equal to, well, they have to be equal to zero. First of all, we have the six kilonewtons, six times a distance of eight meters, plus another six times a distance of 16 meters, plus another six. Now let's see here, should we call them plus or minus? These are indeed clockwise torques or clockwise moments, and clockwise typically would be negative, so I might as well put negative signs in front of them. That's a little bit more accurate, make those negative. And we have another six kilonewtons multiplied times, that would now be 24 meters, minus three times 32 meters. And that's then counterbalanced by the single force on the support pushing in this direction. That would be force at E. And so there we get a plus force at E times 32 meters. And that should all add up to zero, which means that the force at E is equal to, when you move all those across the other side, let me go ahead and use a calculator on that. So I have 8 plus 6, that's 24, that's 48. That's 48 times 6 plus 96. That gives me 384 divided by 32. That's better, I believe. 384 divided by 32. And that gives me 12 kilonewtons. Remember that these were all in kilonewtons. All right, so the force here is equal to 12 kilonewtons. And now I'm ready to go ahead and use this corner right here, this joint, to try and sum up all the forces. Now notice in the vertical direction, we have 12, 12 kilonewtons acting upward and three acting downward. That's a net, net nine kilonewtons acting upward. So here's this joint, nine kilonewtons. And then we have this force right here from E to G. Now remember, if this is pushing up this way and this is pushing down this way, then this must be under. And let me use a different color. I'm going to try and determine all the compression and tension of all these. So this should be under compression. And this must be under compression as well because it's being pushed from both directions. That means that this is under compression. This one is under compression. Now, if these forces are pushing down this way, this way, and this way, that means that these two members are pushing this way. The force from the six kilonewtons gets transferred here, push it down on these two members, it transfers the force this way, it transfers the force this way, which means that this joint is being pulled down in this way. That means this must be under tension, otherwise there's no, nothing to support this. So what's supporting the forces on these two members is the tension in this member holding it up, otherwise this would fall down like that. So that's under tension. Since the forces are being deflected along these members, this member here should have zero tension on it or zero compression because there's nothing on the other side to compensate for it. So I think we can already write down that the forces on these two members are zero. This one is under tension. This is compression, 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 compression. That means this must also be under compression here and here. And now these members here, they have to be under tension. If this was not connected here, and this is under compression, this beam would slide out this way. This is keeping that from doing. And this beam keeps that from sliding out. So we have this is under tension, 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 and tension for these four members at the bottom right here. So now we've determined all the tension and compression of all the members of the roof truss. Now, the next thing we should do is continue with this corner right here. 
It is under tension. That means we have a force in this direction. And finally, we have this under compression. So this is pushing against this joint. So I have a force in this direction. This is 9 kilonewtons. We're trying to find the force between G and E. And we're trying to find the force between D and E at the bottom here. And that should be proportional to the size of these members. Let me use a different color. Notice that this member here is 10 meters long. This member here is 8 meters long. And this member here is 6 meters long. Which means that the forces must be proportional to the length of those members. That tells us we can write 9 divided by 6 is equal to GE divided by 10, which is equal to DE divided by 8. So we simply do a proportion between the forces and the lengths of the members. This tells us that GE is equal to 9 times 10 divided by 6. That would be 90 divided by 6, which is 15 kilonewtons. And here DE is equal to 9 times 8 divided by 6. That's 72 divided by 6, which is 12 kilonewtons. Okay, let's write those results in here. The one on the bottom, that is 12 kilonewtons. That means this one here has a force of 12 kilonewtons on it. That means this must also be 12 kilonewtons because there's no other beams acting in this direction. And because of symmetry, these two must also have 12 kilonewtons on them and 12 kilonewtons. The one here on the slant side, that's GE, must be 15 kilonewtons. So this one has a force of 15 kilonewtons, and this one has a force of 15 kilonewtons. Where should we go next? Zero, zero, we have six. Notice here, we can determine the force on this one here by looking at this joint. So let's go ahead and grab this joint right here and add up all the forces in all the directions on that joint. So let's come over this way. Let's draw that joint. We have six kilonewtons pushing in this direction. Here, this is on the compression, so we have 15 kilonewtons in this direction. And this is on the compression, so we have a certain amount of force in this direction. Now, how big should that force be? Oh, we have one more, don't we? We have this compression right here. We, have, we also have to take care of this compression. So we have that force, we have this force. So let's write those in. So it's HF, which is not known, and we have CF, which is not known. What we need to do here is we know that all those forces add up to zero in both the X and the Y directions. What we have also here is we have a relationship between this is 8 meters, this is 6 meters, and this is 10 meters. So if we draw little triangles here, there, we draw a triangle here, we draw a triangle here, and that doesn't need a triangle. Let's go and look at these ratios of these member sizes. In this direction, we know that this member is 10 meters long, the verticals are 6 meters long, and the horizontals are 8 meters long. Same here, the ratio would be 10 to 6 for the vertical to 8 for the horizontal. Again, this would be a ratio of 10 to the horizontal would be 8 and the vertical would be 6. So we're talking about a ratio of 6 for the vertical, 8 for the horizontal, and 10 for the slant. The reason why we want those ratios is because that way we can find the forces according to those ratios as well. I'm going to sum up all the forces in the x direction and all the forces in the y direction and they must add up to 0. The sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to 0. So first of all, we have a negative 6 kilonewtons in this direction, negative 6. In addition to that, we have a positive 15 times the ratio of 6 to 10. So it would be plus 15 times the ratio of 6 to 10, because the vertical component of this force is a ratio of 6 to 10 relative to this one. And on this one here, we have, what is the magnitude of that force? We don't know the magnitude of that force, that is plus CF times the ratio of 6 to 10. We're looking for the vertical. That's the ratio of 6 to 10 as well. 
And then we have this force, which is putting down, that we're pushing downward, that would be minus, that would be HF, the force HF, times the ratio of, again, that would be 6 to 10. Notice that in this equation, we have two unknowns. We have the force CF and the force HF, which is not known, so we need one additional equation. The second equation would be the sum of the forces in the x-direction as up to zero. In the x-direction, we have the following forces. We have this force right here, and the ratio would be 8 to 10. That would be a positive 15 kilonewtons times a ratio of 8 to 10. And then we have the x component of this one pushing in the negative direction. That would be minus CF times a ratio of 8 to 10. And then we have a minus HF, minus HF times a ratio of 8 to 10. So now you can see that we have all the sum of the force in the x direction, all the sum of the force in the y direction with only two unknowns, CF and HF. We can solve those two equations simultaneously to solve for CF and HF, and that will give us the force over here and the force over here, and then we're almost done at that point. How do we do that? Now, first of all, we have minus 6 plus 15 times 6 over 10. That would be 1.5 times that's 9 plus 6. So I'm going to simplify this one as combining this together. That would be positive 3 plus 0 0.6 CF minus 0 0.6 HF. That adds up to 0. Now notice if I multiply both sides of the equation by, let's say, or divide both sides of the equation by 0 0.6, what do I get? 3 divided by 0 0.6. I get, oh, let me do it again. 3 divided by 0 0.6 is equal to 5. So what I can do is I can change this equation to 0 is equal to 5 plus CF minus HF. So there's my first equation, simplified. Now simplifying this equation, notice that this will then become, uh, that would be 12 minus 0 0.8 CF minus 0 0.8 HF. If I divide both sides of the equation by 0 0.8, what's 12 divided by 0 0.8? I believe that's 15. So this equation then can become 15 minus CF minus HF is equal to zero. And there's my second equation. I can now solve those two simultaneously. Let's solve this one for HF. So I'm going to come over here and solve this one. I'll say HF is equal to five plus CF. Simply by moving HF, the other side becomes positive. And then I substitute that into my second equation here I get 15 minus CF minus HF but HF is 5 plus CF that means minus 5 minus CF is equal to 0 moving the CF to the other side I get 10 is equal to 2 CF which means that CF is equal to 5 and if CF is equal to 5 then HF is equal to 10 so now I've determined the forces on the, on the two members, CF and HF. CF is 5, and let me use a different color. I was using red for that. Where did my red pen go? Here we go. So CF is equal to 5 kilonewtons, and HF is equal to 10 kilonewtons. The only thing I have left now is this right here. Now notice if, um, hmm, hmm, oh, I can duplicate that. This would also be 10. This would also be 5, and I think the best thing to do is to go ahead and take a look at this joint right here, because I'm trying to determine the tension in this one last member between H and C. That's the one member I don't have figured out yet. But if I look at this, notice that in the vertical direction, I have 5. This is a compression. That means this member is pushing in this direction, this member is pushing in this direction, and then here we have tension is pulling in this direction. I can then see that the two vertical components of these two members must equal the vertical component, well, there's only one vertical component of this member right here. So let's me, let me ask those forces. So I'm going to come over here, and notice I have the vertical member here, that would be the member from C to H, 
which I don't know what that is equal to. I have this member right here, and I have this member right here. And notice that the magnitude of those members, there are five each. This is five, this is five. But again, notice the ratio of the size of those. So the length of this would be 10. Draw the line over here. The length over here would be eight, and here would be six. And this would be six, and this would be 10, and this would be eight. Okay, I'm now ready to calculate the magnitude of CH. If I only take one of these triangles, this triangle alone, I could then claim that the following is true. I take half of CH, half of CH, divided by six is equal to five, divided by 10, which is equal to, well, I don't need to worry about anything else. I just took this triangle right here. That is good enough. Okay, so CH is equal to five times six divided by 10 times one half. 10 times one half is five. It counts out with this five. I have CH is equal to six kilonewtons. And this one is six kilonewtons. And I have now determined all the forces on every member. Again, the ones on the bottom are all 12 newtons. This one is 15. Those are 10. This one is 6. These two are 5. And that's the total sum. And that's how we do that.